Look who's here. Hi, Ram. Hi. So, Mark Miseres, what yes. are you doing? Uh, I'm uh, preparing a small uh, lecture which is not for this meeting. Uh, okay. But for someone else that I. At your to... level, the lecture should prepare for you, you know. Uh, well, no, no, no. I disagree, uh, Ram, because creating a lecture which is uh, good from content and presentation wise takes a lot of time. You know that. You know that. All right. So, Mark, you are such a pioneer nah. who deserves much more nah. recognition in nah, history man, than please, he has. Please, 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 please. No, please. Really, really. What was it? 2001 or 2002? 2002. You actually came up with the minimally invasive extraperitoneal approach, That's which right. subsequently is now known as ETEP. That's right. And, and now I want to ask you a question, which is very interesting. Why is it that even though you pioneered the extraperitoneal MIS approach mm -hmm. to ventrals and incisionals, yep. it didn't take off really nope. till recently when we started doing the uh, ETEP ventrals yep. uh, after 2015. Well, this, this answer is a lecture on itself, Ram, uh, and it's, it's uh, coincidental, but nobody has asked me that before because I thought someone will ever <laughs> ask me to give a lecture on that specific topic. Um, so now I, you, you want me to, ask, to answer in, in, in a nutshell. Yes. Uh, I think there are two reasons. One reason was we did not close the posterior and the anterior rectus sheet at that time. Uh, and we saw some patients coming up with bulge. Um, the bulge, I believe, is related to the not closing of the posterior rectus sheet. So that's number one. Now that we have the tools, minimally invasive and robotic-wise, to close posterior and anterior rectus sheet, we have barbed sutures. So this makes it more easy. So that's, that's I think, the most important uh, answer. And that's also the reason why I, in 2002 and 2003, when I looked at my first 15 patients on the longer term, I abandoned. Because at that time, some patients came back with a bulge and I did not see the extra benefit of doing it minimally invasive. I just saw the drawback because they did not have less wound infections, they did not have a better quality of life, they didn't go home, they didn't go home earlier. So that's why at that time when I had to look at the balance, I said, this doesn't make sense to continue. Are you doing ETEP ventrals these days? I am doing ETEP ventrals these days, but very, very, very limited. And that's my second answer. Uh, why don't I do it personally in my clinic? There are two reasons. First of all, my colleague is taking care of the robotic uh, surgery so that's that's for her she's 10 years younger and that's her baby <laughs> to say so that's number one secondly with the current uh, generation of master slave robots i'm not so sure what exactly is the place for robotics in the inguinals i think it's very doubtful you can discuss ergonomics for the surgeon but this is another uh, outcome parameter of course for the very giant ones i believe and I discussed with Iro Bejanski already a few years ago, I believe we also need to look at patient quality of life, abdominal wall function and aesthetics. And in those large giant hernias, 10, 15, 16 centimeter width, with retraction of the skin, with a hernia sac coming very close to the skin, I believe you can do a better job when you do it open, reconstruct bilateral tar, nice reconstruction and closing the abdominal wall in different layers with a nice aesthetic and functional result. I think we need to wait for the results comparing minimal invasive in the giant uh, abnormal wall hernias versus the classical open uh, way. And maybe a last remark, if I may, is we all know that doing an open tar also, especially if you combine it with local infiltration, is very well accepted by the patient concerning reconvalescence in the first stage post-op. So, and, and then in, the mid, in between you have the middle-sized hernia. And we will hear it in the next session here in Copenhagen, whether it makes sense for a middle-sized hernia, four, five, six centimeters, to do that. I think it will for patients with diastasis, for patients with morbid obesity, for the patients where we believe that uh, limiting or diminishing wound complications is an important uh, aspect because of their constitution, because of their comorbidity. And there I think the robot might have a place. So you can see this is my second answer. To the, whole que to the whole question that you posed, the place now for minimally invasive robotic surgery or ETEP without a robot, to my opinion, is limited. But of course, we need to be open, we need to examine it, we need to look at it constructively in a prospective way, and uh, well, we probably know more with, uh, with the, the robots also now 
coming up from other companies, so prices will go down, it will be more accessible, and uh, star. Oh. <laughs> and, 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 and we'll see what, what's coming up in next meetings, next publications uh, in the years to come. As someone who pioneered a procedure and then had the honesty to abandon it, mm -hmm. your words definitely make sense and have credibility. Thank you so much, Mark Miseres. Very welcome, Ram. Very welcome.